Folks, I don't know how to say this any more plainly. The war in Ukraine is effectively over. It has been for a long time. It, it really, I think, even back during the summer, before the, the, the offensive in 2023, it was, it was evident by looking at an unemotional uh, list of the facts and an assessment of, of the reality, the ground truth reality on the, on the battlefield, it was evident that Ukraine was not going to be able to win that war. It was so clear then, it is even more clear now. Although you would be hard pressed to believe that if you actually watch a lot of those senior Western leaders. So if you look at some of our retired generals uh, and some of our current politicians, you may be tempted to think, wow, no, I think that they're saying that there's actually a shot and it's all about the cash. As a matter of fact, you may have seen in the news today uh, that overnight the Senate, which has been working for months on, on this foreign aid bill, a very complicated one. They wanted uh, the the White House wanted 65. I'm sorry, 95 billion dollars to go to Taiwan, to go to Israel, and to go to Ukraine, among other things, and a handful of other smaller things in there. But thus, the the bulk of it was 60 billion dollars for Ukraine. The people who've been crafting this bill, and it's a bipartisan bill, actually passed uh, early this morning. In a very strange, I think it was like started voting at 5 a.m. So a very unusual. Uh, for the Senate to be uh, operating overnight and then into the early morning here. Uh, but the uh, the Senate Majority Leader, Chuck Schumer, uh, went at, before the American people today in a celebratory uh, press conference. And you'll see here in just a second how he was uh, praising the, the efforts of these people, that it was an o pass with an overwhelming majority of the Senate. Uh, 70, 70 people voting for, I believe, was the number. Uh, and, and at least on face value, that's a true statement. It's it's hardly anything that you get a bipartisan majority in the U.S. Senate today with that much of a majority. So truly, that was a big deal. But then Schumer's going to go on to make some pretty odd claims about what was at stake and what he thinks this money is going to do. Here he goes. Today, after not just a long night and weekend, but after months of work, we can say it's been worth it. Today, we witnessed one of the most historic and consequential bills passed the Senate, a bill that so greatly impacts not just our national security, not just the security of our allies, but also the security of Western democracy as we know it. But if the hard right kills this bill, it would be an enormous gift to Vladimir Putin. It would be a betrayal of our partners and allies and an abandonment of our service members. That it's hard to see where to start with that. Uh, that is, I, I mean, in, in kind of words I can say, detached from reality. I, I mean, to say that number one, that this is a great victory, it's a bill. It's just half of a bill. And if it doesn't pass in the house, it's nothing but a waste of time and just, uh, just another effort of, of accomplishing nothing. So by itself, the bill does absolutely nothing. And as I'll show you here in a few minutes, uh, as the House Speaker warned before this bill ever went to a vote, that it's basically dead on arrival. And there's no reason to think he's changed it since that time. We'll see how things play out there. But let's actually look at what was actually discussed in here. What, what Schumer said was that this is a great national security bill for the United States. That's an odd thing to claim when the provisions for our national security on the border was stripped out. Now, it's a little odd just on the political part of it, why so many Republicans uh, have opted to, to vote for a bill that had the border provisions stripped out when the Republican voter block is such a big deal on border security. I mean, even across the board, American uh, poll, pollsters are showing that American public opinion is overwhelmingly saying that the number one voting issue for them right now is the crisis at the border. So given that the U.S. border is the biggest thing on the American people's radars, why in the world would you want to pass this bill and claim it's for American national security without actually providing anything for American national security. It's really strange that they would say that. Now, I can certainly see why people of Ukraine would love to have $60 billion or people in Israel would have this, I think, $17 billion or the folks in Taiwan would love to have however many billions they had. I mean, certainly that makes some sense, but that's foreign issues. That's what other countries would benefit from, not 
the United States. So that's the first point there. The second, I thought, really odd thing is he saying this is this is going to help prevent uh, provide security for the Western democracy as we know it. I mean, this really big, grandiose kind of language is flourishing rhetoric. And you think, wow, what's going on that, that Western democracy is at risk? Well, it's not. There's there's nothing at risk at all. That's complete nonsense. And and I, $95 billion is not going to buy security that otherwise wouldn't be there. Because that's the, the claim, as, as you heard him say in the second half of his statement there, that if the Republican far right, as he calls it, you know, kills the bill and doesn't pass their half of it, then all these consequential things are going to happen. And it's going to be a gift to Putin. And it's going to put American national security at risk. And our troops are going to be abandoned and betrayed. That is that is just detached from reality. There is no truth to that whatsoever. Putin doesn't need a gift from this U.S. Senate. I'll just put it that way or the House. He doesn't need one. He has his own force and they're doing whatever they're going to do. And it is frankly part of the extreme arrogance that thinks that what happens in the, the sacred halls of the U.S. Senate, the rest of the world just is going to sit around and, and wait with bated breath to see what happens. And everything is going to be determined based on what they say. It's not. Putin is watching. He's curious, uh, but he's not going to pay any attention one way or the other. He's got his own issues to deal with. He's got his own problems. He's got his own capabilities. And that's what he's using and the, their national interest. That's what's driving Putin's actions. And it's not going to matter what the U.S. does or doesn't do in terms of him going after his objectives. He's going after them no matter what the Senate does. And we've already given, let's be clear, look at back at the record, uh, $113 plus billion plus already. Europe has given somewhere around $100 billion, So well over $200 billion has been given so far. What did that do? What did that buy? What did that produce? Did that produce security for Western democracy as we know it? Or did it absolutely go into the toilet? What happened with this grandiose offensive that happened last year that was had so much hype that Zelensky told everybody was going to succeed, that David Petraeus told everybody in America it was going to succeed. All of these experts said it was going to succeed, and it fell flat on its face as I told you it was going to, not because I have some brilliant insight, but because I'm willing to look at reality on the ground and call it the way it is. But we have this detachment from reality that we have, and I'm picking on Schumer because he's the one, he was the speaker. He's the one that made the, the statement there, but it's endemic among many politicians that they want to say that they want to have this rhetoric that if they say it with enough enthusiasm, that it will become true. And it's not going to folks. It's not going to become true, but I wish that it was just limited to our politicians. I wish I could say, but our military men, the people who have experience, who've, who've also worn the uniform for decades of time, they see it for the way it is too. Unfortunately, they're among some of the worst offenders and who better to show than to demonstrate that than our favorite Jack Keane. We've got to get the funding to Ukraine. I mean, if, if Ukraine doesn't get the money, they're going to lose. Yeah. And, you know, we got to make up our mind what kind of world we really want to live in. Do we want to really have the Iranians driving what's happening in the Middle East? Do we want to have Russia expanding beyond Ukraine? And we have to put considerably more forces into Europe as a result of that mm. and spend a heck of a lot more money than what we would be spending on helping Ukraine? Is this really what we want? Where? China, Russia, and Iran are calling the shots, and we're on our heels. That's what we'll. That's what we're heading towards mm -hmm. if we walk away. So much wrong with that. And again, that's why I love this channel. I love having deep dives so that I can explain to you why some of those things are nonsense. Maybe you've never served in the military before. Maybe you hear a, a, a four-star retired general like that with a lot of gravitas and a really deep voice and a great presence on television when he says those things. A lot of people are going, well, I mean, it doesn't, I don't see anything like that happening on the ground, but I mean, maybe he knows something I don't know. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to do a deep dive on what he said there. And I'm going to show you, no, you're not wrong. What he's saying doesn't make any sense. On the very first thing he says, without this money, Ukraine won't win. Folks, the money's not going to make any difference. Ukraine will not win if they give triple this amount of money. And they're, they're not going to avoid losing either way. This war is already, past tense, lost. The sides are still fighting. There's still a lot of contact. There's still people killing and dying every day. 
but it's not going to change the outcome. It's already cemented in there because of the combat fundamentals, the fundamentals of what builds national combat power on both sides is has, has set the stage. There's virtually no way to reverse course on this. There's no rational path to victory that, that emphasizing sending more money would somehow solve. So he's wrong on that point blank. Uh, the next thing he says is, uh, he says, we have to do this because otherwise we have to find out what kind of world we want to live in, but where we would have to send American troops into Europe to defend Europe if Ukraine doesn't win. No, 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 no. We don't need to send one American troop there. There's this thing called NATO. Don't know if you've heard about it. A bunch of European nations are over there, very wealthy European nations. They have armed forces. We don't need to provide their security for them. They have the reason they have national military forces is to defend their territory, just like our forces are to defend our territory. NATO has a mutual defense treaty, the Article 5. So we'll go help each other out. We'll help. We don't provide it for them. This idea that, that we have to send troops if there's any kind of threat to anything is just nonsense because that gives a, an out to the European countries not to provide more of their own security because they know they got Uncle Sam over their shoulder. And in fact, they got Uncle Sam in front of their shoulder. They got him in front because everybody wants the U.S. to be the lead defender, not, not the, the second tier, not the backup. We should be the backup for the frontline European troops. That's what help is. It's a profound help. It's a profound potential that we will help you if you need it. We're not going to do it for you. We should not. And, and that's not American leadership, which many perversely say. That's fraud. That's wasting American money. And it's allowing others to, to do less for themselves than they should do for themselves. By all rights, ought to do for themselves. So he's wrong on that one, too. Um, then he says, hey, we can't because we're back on our heels. The only reason we're on our heels is because we don't have a strategy. And he's talking about the Middle East. He's talking about Europe. He's talking about Asia. Problem is we don't have a strategy. We love to throw money at stuff, but we don't really have a strategy on what it's going to do, how it's going to work, or a path that says here, based on the money that we're spending, we can do this to accomplish that. That's where this cold conversation should start. What is realistically possible? What do the opposing forces in the area have? What is our national interest? And then what's a plan to get it done? And then finally, what would that cost? What can we afford? Can we afford what we want? Do we have enough money? All of those things should happen in that order. You don't start with the cash. You don't write a check first and say, by the way, what's this for? I mean, how many of you do that? Your kid says, yeah, I'd like a check for $50,000. And you write the check out and hand it to them and go, what's it for? You know what, you know what I'm saying? You're not going to do that. You won't do that for anyone, not even your own child. But yet that's what Congress wants us to do. There is no strategy. There's no path to victory. They just want your money. Uh, and you know, the, the last thing he says is, you know, this, if all these horrible things are going to happen, if we just walk away, no one is saying that we should just walk away because we haven't walked away at any point. We have provided thousands upon thousands of our own combat vehicles to this fight, millions of shells, hundreds of thousands of, of rockets, uh, missiles, interceptors, mil hundreds of millions of rounds of, of regular ammunition. Uh, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable all the things that we have provided so far. I, I'm not, I don't know of anybody and I'm not advocating. We literally go to zero and just drop the, you know, drop them off the cliff. But what I am saying and in, enthusiastically, emphatically, I'm saying what does make sense, what is a viable path is to say, we're going to help you with some amount of money to defend yourself, to keep the lines where they are while you negotiate an end to the war. There's a provision for it. It's not just a blank check, just like we should not send a blank check to Israel. We shouldn't just say, here's a bunch of money for whatever you want. That's one of the big problems I found with this bill that at least what's been publicly announced, there's no strings to any of it. Nobody it doesn't say we'll give you this money as long as we'll provide this help with these provisions. There's nothing. There's just here's a check. What are you going to do with it? That's that's just that's the wrong answer. We should have provisions on there. Our, this money should not just be sent with a blank check because then that leaves it up to the recipient to do whatever they want, whether it is or is not in American national interest. And since this is your money we're talking about, since this money comes from your pocket, 
money raised through our tax revenue or borrowed in your name, which is even worse. That's just, it's, it's absurd to suggest that you shouldn't have a say in how it's spent. We should. So whether it's, it's the, uh, the uh, speaker of the, the Senate or some of these generals, what they're telling you doesn't make any sense and it should not be followed. Now let's look at the specific of the bill itself, because Schumer was talking this great, you know, victory speech at the beginning, which I thought was very odd because the Speaker of the House told them beforehand he's not going to pass this bill because the House recognizes and it acts on the fact that the people really do care about border security. So he's not going to pass this big so-called national security uh, bill that doesn't talk about national security to America. And he made his point very clear when he uh, released this uh, statement earlier today in which he says, uh, look, the, the, the discussions of this so-called national security supplemental legislation must recognize that national security begins at our border. And then he said that to help end the ongoing catastrophe at the border, instead, the Senate's forum bill is silent on the most pressing issue facing our country and then he says, now in the absence of having received a single border policy change from the Senate, the House will have to continue to work its own will on these important matters. He's very clear that he's not going to pass that bill. He's going to have to pass something with border security. Now, that's been the thing that, that uh, Mike Johnson has said from the beginning. Certainly most Republicans know. And now 86 percent of Americans want it. It would be nonsense. It would be political suicide to pass that bill without anything on the border. He would never get the, the vote, certainly not from the Republicans. And he has to have all the Republican votes pretty much. So you have a situation where you have the Senate going down one path, you have the House going down another, it's not going to result in any money. So we're probably talking in realistic, even if they later come together to do something, even if there are some strings attached to it, it's going to be a long time before that happens. So what's happening in the meantime? Well, as our as our good friend Alex from History Legend shows us, things are not looking good for the Ukraine side. In this video, we see the perspective of a squad of riflemen in that same sector. At one point, they disembark and jump from one crater to another because of the complete lack of cover. Ukrainians are not far in front. For some time, they're pinned down by mortars until they manage to take hold of some trenches. The media talked a lot about the lack of artillery shells for the Ukrainian army and how foreign deliveries are so low, which obviously leads to a decrease of firepower for the Ukrainian artillery. But the Ukrainian army, they're smart. And they compensated for this loss with a drastic increase of locally produced FPV drones. And from what we see, this was a highly effective change of doctrine. Although it's not as if they really had a choice. So they, the Ukraine side has shown from the beginning of this war that they are extremely brave, extremely willing to, to effective fighters, that they will shy from no fear and, and they just don't back down. Now that's good and it's bad because it's good because that's what thwarted Russia's initial invasion that Russia took a huge gamble when they invaded with too few forces in February, 2022 to actually conquer the whole country. They didn't count on, on Ukraine fighting so ferociously. And so that's what, really put us into this situation we're in now where the current line of contact, which has not changed basically since November of 2022. I'm not sure people are aware of that. It's, it's been moving slowly to the, to the West uh, here in the last few months as after Ukraine's failed offensive, the Russia has been going on a methodical slow offensive uh, from their side. And they actually have been going, uh, moving the line. So it's not static. It is moving to the West. There haven't been any big moves so far, but the casualty counts are just through the roof on both sides. But the thing is, Ukraine doesn't have the number of troops that the Russian side has. They don't have the number of, of available reserves that the Russians have. Russians have millions more men that they can have. Uh, uh, Alex was showing there about the number of, of FPV drones. It's first, uh, first person view, which basically means you're flying the camera and you fly it right into the target. That's what FPV means. And you saw those are some pretty big warheads that they have. Those are uh, 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 rocket propelled grenade uh, rounds, it looked like to me on there. Uh, and, and sure enough, Ukraine is doing everything they can creatively to, to expand the number of drones to compensate for the lack of artillery rounds. Problem is, so is Russia. So yes, they are doing that, but Russia has an industrial capacity. For, for According to reports, most of these 
uh, Ukrainian FPV drones and some of the others, as you saw in that picture, look like they're homemade because that's kind of what they are. There's lots of little mom and pop shops all over the country because they can't afford to have uh, a, a big factory making them because Russia has this strategic ability all throughout the country to launch rockets uh, and missiles and destroy big factories, which they do on a routine basis. Ukraine doesn't have that capacity, so Russia can build these big factories, and they have. And now that they're producing large-scale numbers of, of all kinds of drones, uh, whether it's the Lancet, uh, some of these the bigger, the Oron, Orion, I think it's called, um, and many other smaller versions, their own FPV drones. I mean, they've got lots of it and many of them. And, and they also have more artillery shells. So every capacity is on the Russian side. They have the advantage, and it's a big one. Manpower, drones, artillery, mechanized warfare, tanks, air defense, air force. Everything you want to measure is in Russia's favor. And as, as CNN is reporting there, you know, in the, one of the biggest places in Avdivka, uh, the, the Russians are making more and more advances. And, uh, and actually, there was a, a report out today, uh, many reports that, that in the, on the way to Avdivka, Ukraine, as the, after they got their new uh, governor, uh, not governor, uh, commanding general, after they fired Zaluzhny, Sersky is the new one. And he's he one of his first acts was to move reinforcements into Evdivka because they have been losing uh, ground there. Well, problem is they, they got about 30, 40 kilometers away from the front to conduct some training of these newly mobilized people. And Russia apparently found out where they were. Uh, and according to some information that came out soon, Gary, if you can throw that other image up there. Uh, now that one there, apparently Ukraine, uh, in Ukraine, the Russian forces struck this town called Solidovo with Iskander missiles, which is a tactical strategic missile. It's a big one. Uh, uh, and it took out, you know, usually used that for long range to hit large targets, but they found out where these people were. And according to this one at the time, they said up to 600 people had been confirmed killed on the Ukraine side. Other reports I saw just before going on air here said that number could be up to 3,000. So the core of these reserves that Sersky was planning to send to Avdivka have been interdicted and killed or wounded in, in large numbers before they ever get there, meaning that there's not going to be any help coming on the front line there for Avdivka, for the Ukraine side. So in every way you want to look, tactically, strategically, economically, uh, the ability to, to create industrial capacity. Everything is on the Russian side. Manpower, hugely on the Russian side. There is no rational path to victory here, folks. There's just not one. So when you have Schumer saying, we have to have this to defend the democracy in the West as we know it is just absurd. If Ukraine falls, Russia is not going beyond that. They have had their hands full to get a sliver of one country on their border after two years of all that war. And they've lost, God only knows, hundreds of thousands of troops and tens of thousands of armored vehicles, et cetera. Upon what rational basis can anyone suggest that this same force, which can't get more than 17% of the country they've been fighting, is going to suddenly go to a 32 member military alliance of the most modern technological capacity nuclear powered plan, uh, formation on the earth. It's, it's absurd. So many things are absurd. There's it's simple, basic logic. They're not going to commit suicide. They haven't done it this far. They haven't used nuclear weapons in Ukraine because they know it would be suicide. So what do you think they're going to do if they face a 32 member alliance? They would be foolhardy to the extreme to do that. And, and it would be self-defeating and Russia isn't self-defeating. They're not going to do it. So there is no danger to Western democracy. Schumer is wrong. Just flat out, objectively, that is untrue. Now, Keene is saying that if we don't give this money to Ukraine, they're going to lose. That's untrue, too. And I just explained to you in graphic detail why. Because the money won't matter. If you give the money, if you don't give the money, the outcome is the same. It's already determined because of the fundamentals that go into building combat power and that go into building uh, war power. All those things are set in stone and they're constantly moving in Russia's favor. They're increasing on the one side and decreasing on the other side. And you're not going to reverse those in this generation. It's just not going to happen. The, the casualties have been too high on the Ukraine side. The loss is too great and they cannot be recovered at this late hour, while the side that 
as the bigger side is getting stronger. It's rational. It's logical. So why is it that the American leaders can't do what makes sense? Why can't they do something that's logical? Now, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that one because I, 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 it boggles my mind when I see them making these kinds of statements that are self-evidently untrue. And I don't know if it's that, well, their job depends on it. This is what they have to do. They have to say these things, even though they don't believe them. I don't know. Could well be that Schumer knows good and well that Mike Johnson's not going to give in and change the bill on something so fundamental to his side about border security. So he wants to celebrate this just to make the other side look bad politically. Maybe he thinks that'll help him in the midterm or the, not the midterms, but the congressional elections that are coming up alongside the presidential election. I don't know. All I do know is that the words coming out of his mouth are untrue and inaccurate. Do not listen to them. What J Jack Keene is saying, I don't know if it's because that's his job, because uh, he's, he's you know on the board of a lot of defense contractors who make lots of money if we keep selling all these things. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's something to that. Maybe somehow he believes it. I can't imagine how, with all the experience that he's got, that he could not see the same things that I do, that I've been telling you about for more than two years, because I laid this out at least six months before the war started. And it's played out not quite the way I thought. It's, it's taken longer for Russian side, but the end has not changed. It's just the timing has been different than what I thought it might have been at the beginning. That's it. Nothing different. The outcome is the same. As I've been saying throughout this entire war, and I've been saying on this channel ever since we've been on the air, you can see that. Now then the question is, what are we going to do about it? So are we going to just keep voting for the same people over and over, even though they tell us things that aren't true? Are we going to keep believing people who keep saying things that are self-evidently untrue or inaccurate? I think the answer should be no. And I think you should make your, your voice heard. I mean, we've said it before. A lot of people think there's nothing you can do. Well, there is something you can do. Write your legislator. Write your congressman, write your senator, tell them what you actually feel. You keep sending these letters and tell them stuff when they say nonsense like this, that's going to have an impact because they do care about votes. They do care about when their constituents get mad. So do whatever you can. Uh, tell your friends, share it on social media. Tell them this is the truth. I'm telling you the truth here. And it's self-evidently so. Just like what they're saying is self-evidently untrue. The things that we talk about on this channel can be validated and verified by ground truth. What you see on the ground matches what we're telling you, folks. Let your friends know about this so that they have the truth, at least. And then who knows? Maybe they can take some action, too. Maybe some of them will even run for office themselves. I don't know, but I sure hope so, because I'd sure love to see some great folks get in there. Some of them just like you. Some of you guys have some great ideas. Um, listen, uh, I, and I, I wish I had said this at the beginning. I'm going to start saying it a little more often here. Uh, we have a, a, a feature here where you can make comments in there. And very often we love to put some of the comments on the screen uh, because you, you guys have some some good things to say. We love to hear from you. Uh, if you have questions about some things, uh, Gary's watching this sometimes and he'll throw them up on the screen if I'm uh, looking at the camera like I am right now. Uh, so that's why we got a good team with that. Um, want to hear what you have to say. So, you know, feel free to engage more because we actually do pay attention to those kinds of things. And so do other people. I don't know how many times I've heard a video uh, of, from somebody who's seen one of our videos and they tell me what they read in the comments section. So people read these things. So uh, when you engage here, uh, you're, you're actually making a difference because people do read the, the videos and, and the comments that you write. So we ask you to do that. Uh, folks, we got some things coming up here for you. We got uh, Ambassador Chaz Freeman tomorrow is going to give us an update on things in the Middle East. He's a former ambassador to Saudi Arabia, U.S. ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Uh, he's got some terrific insights. You're not going to want to miss that. Uh, also, Matthew Ho, one of our show favorites, will be on, I believe, at 11 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, you'll want to tune in to see that. And as we close out today, uh, I'm going to play uh, just a, a small clip uh, of something that uh, I found this afternoon on, on the on the uh, t uh, on the online here uh, that was said by Senator Josh Hawley. I don't, I don't agree with a lot of things he says, but when someone's right, I, I, I acknowledge it, and he is spot on here. Where he's talking about the situation going on with President Biden. Uh, is he cog does he have the cognitive ability to continue doing this job? This uh, this special investigator that came up the her report they call it uh, when people are saying, "Hey, look, um, President Biden did a lot of things, but we're not going to." We're not going to prosecute. Many on the left are saying that that report exonerated the president. It did not exonerate him. It said they're not going to press charges, but it acknowledged 
Well, I'm going to let Senator Hawley talk to you about it. But, but if you want to see some of our sh shows, because we actually did a show earlier today and also one a couple of days ago, Bi Biden's cognitive ability is it endangering America. Feel free to go and take a look at that after this video is over here, uh, because yeah, you'll find it very interesting. But let me leave you with what Josh Hawley says, and we'll see you next time on Daniel Davis Deep Dive. It can't possibly be that Joe Biden at one and the same time is not capable of standing trial and Sean can still be president of the United States. It's one or the other. And what the special counsel said is he willfully retained classified documents. He willfully disclosed them. That's a crime. But the special counsel said, oh, but I can't charge him because, you know, he can't stand trial. Well, all right, then he shouldn't be president. So Garland needs to either charge Biden prosecute him or go to the cabinet under the 25th amendment and say guys he can't be president we need to remove him that's the choice it's one or the other you can't have it both ways